Good morning. If you would please join with me in turning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. We are normally uh, making our way through the gospel of Mark on Sunday mornings, verse by verse. And in the evenings, we've been in the book of Malachi. But last week and this week, we're doing something a bit different. I'm preparing to uh, go and have the joyful privilege of meeting with pastors in Jordan and in Egypt, and we're talking about preaching. And so what I'm going to share with them, I wanted to share with you. So this is something very much out of the ordinary for us. This is um, more of a subject study. It's more of a topical um, sermon, but from time to time that's okay. And, and so we're going to set our focus today on, on this particular subject. And the subject we're dealing with last week and this week is uh, entitled Shepherds That Preach. We're thinking about preaching and we're thinking about pastoral ministry. Pastoral preaching is what we're considering. So for our starting point this morning, let's look at 1 Peter 5. We'll read beginning at verse 1 down to verse 4. Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What is preaching to be? We live in a day of much preaching. I don't know that, that we have ever been exposed to more preaching. I don't know that we've ever had more opportunities to hear preaching than the day in which we live because sermons are all over the internet that can be downloaded and listened to, whether it's in audio form or video form. We have all kinds of opportunity to hear preaching. But much preaching doesn't equal faithful preaching. Much preaching doesn't equal good preaching. What is preaching to be? And our thesis is a simple one, but I think it's a profoundly important one. We have said that preaching is to be a shepherd's work. Now, it may sound like we haven't said much when we say that preaching is to be a shepherd's work. Now, for some, that may be, you know, sort of a duh moment, <laughs> But, but when you unpack that, when you understand what a shepherd's work is, and then you say that preaching is to be a shepherd's work, I think it's actually extremely informative. If preaching is to be what God means for it to be, then the men who preach must be what God means for them to be. Let me say it again. If preaching is to be what God means for it to be, then the men who preach must be what God means for them to be. I mean, the man matters. The man who delivers the sermon matters. And God means for preachers to be shepherds. Preaching is a work in the interest of pastoral care. All preaching is, is to have a pastoral trajectory. It is, in, it is in the interest of caring for God's people. And every act of pastoral care is in truth an application of the word preached. We preach to shepherd people, and as we shepherd people, we apply what has been preached. So that preaching and pastoral care must not ever be divided, not in our thinking and not in our practice, precisely because God has united these two things, pastoral care and preaching, God has united these two things in His Word. In a book entitled On Being a Pastor, Derek Prime and Alistair Begg 
shared this, quote, shepherding and teaching should not be separated. Preaching and pastoral work help each other. Visiting enhances our preaching and that it helps us to appreciate how our fellow believers think, their problems, and their temptations. When we preach to those we know well and whose situations we understand, we apply God's truth more relevantly, almost unconsciously, and probably the less consciously, the better. I like that. Let me just stop for just a moment and comment for, for just a second. What they're saying is, it's not like you're consciously having to say, let me be pastoral as I preach. It's just as you love the people and live among your people, preaching becomes more pastoral. The less consciously, the better. Amen. It goes on to say this, our visits and counseling have greater relevance too because the members of the flock associate us with the word they have heard taught and preached. And in one-to-one -one conversations, we're able to apply the same word more personally and in greater depth, close quote. Now, the only thing that I would ch change in that quote is when they say preaching and pastoral work help each other. I would simply add they don't just help each other. They are necessary to each other. God has wed them together. And the last time, last week, we offered our first evidence for this, for, for, for making this case. And we talked about the New Testament charges that are addressed to, the, to those who lead and teach the church. Uh, when we talk about a charge, we're talking about an authoritative impartation of responsibility. Someone says, with authority, uh, from heaven as it were, here is what you are responsible to do. And when you read the New Testament charges given to those who lead and teach the church, you see that our work as a whole is described as shepherding, and then preaching is a subset of that. It, it serves in the interest of shepherding the church. We looked at three charges. We looked at Christ's charge to Peter in John 21. We looked at Paul's charge to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and then we listened to Peter's charge to his fellow elders in the passage we just read, 1 Peter chapter 5. In each case, what was emphasized is that the, the sheep are God's. The church is God's church. Christ is the, is the chief shepherd of the church. And so under shepherds are simply mediating the chief shepherd's love for his people. We, we shepherd on behalf of Christ. We shepherd out of love for Christ and therefore love for his people. And and we saw in each case that the, the means by which we shepherd the church is God's Word. To shepherd the church is to feed the church. To shepherd the church is to give the church the words of God. And so in each case, the shepherds are teachers. They are proclaimers. They are heralds of the Word of God. That is not to say that every elder preaches regularly publicly. We preach the Word publicly and house to house. You teach the Word of God publicly and personally. But every elder, though he may not be a preacher, every elder, in the public sense, in the, in the formal sense, every elder is to be apt to teach, able to teach. Every elder has as his work the sharing, the proclamation, the teaching, the instructing of the Word of God. This is how we shepherd the church. What we're talking about is a mindset. When you talk about pastoral preaching, you're not talking about some sort of new methodology. I think the methodology is explained by the nature of Scripture and by the nature of shepherding. The, the methodology is expository preaching. The methodology, if our task is to give you the words of God, then the Word of God is not a launching point from which we give our own thoughts to you. Rather, we strive to simply give you God's thoughts, and, and God's thoughts are His words. And the best way to give you God's thoughts are to simply track God's thoughts verse by verse, word by word, in consecutive fashion through the Scriptures. And so that's why we preach in an expository way. So that, that's a given if you understand what Scripture is and what shepherding is. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about a new methodology. I'm talking about a mindset 
We are shepherds, and if we understand that that is our work, then it will affect our preaching and teaching. So we talked about those charges. I think they make clear that these two things can't be divorced from each other, pastoral care and preaching. But now this morning I want to share a second evidence. Not only the New Testament charges given to the men who lead and teach the church, but secondly, we see that preaching is a pastoral work when we consider the descriptions, the New Testament descriptions of those who lead and teach the church. How does the Bible describe the church's leaders and teachers? What titles are used for the men who lead and teach the church? And again, I want to underscore how vital it is that we embrace the Bible's language, that we think of our work in biblical terms. I want to remind us of why this emphasis on shepherd preachers matters. We are facing some very real crises in our day when it comes to how we just think about pastoral ministry. I mean, the church has suffered in many cases because we think of the work wrongly. If you don't conceive of a work rightly, you don't execute it rightly. How you do your work begins in your mind. And if you don't think of your work the right way, you'll never practice it the right way. And so when you think about pastoral ministry, I mean, it, it seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? That you would use the word pastoral, pastoral ministry. But if you don't think of your pastoral ministry in pastoral terms, you'll never carry out ministry in the way that God designed. So before, you know, b- being faithful in this work, I'll say it this way, being faithful in this work means not just being convinced of what God means for us to be, but being convinced, therefore, of what we must not be. You have to embrace both sides of that equation. You have to know what a pastor is not in order to understand what a pastor is. What is a, what, what, as we think about the, the misconceptions in our days, we think about the ministry malpractice in our day, we need to be reminded of what pastors are not. Pastors are not entertainers. Our task is not to entertain you. Pastors are not businessmen. The church is not a corporation. It's not a business. And we're trying to figure out how to best manage it. That's not the church. And that's not a pastor. Pastors are not self-promoters. We live in a day where everybody wants influence and everybody is promoting himself. That's not what pastors do. Pastors are not academics. And by that I mean, you know, we don't sit in the, in the high and lofty tower of, of, of some educational institution, cut off from people. No, we, we are not that. We are not social activists. We are not social workers. We are not social commentators. Pastors are not growth strategists. We are shepherds, simple, common shepherds, under shepherds, in fact, which means we are servants and slaves of the chief shepherd. We serve Christ, and we serve Christ through the high and lofty privilege of serving you. That's what shepherds are. And, and, and the analogies that are used, beyond the shepherd analogy, the analogies used in the New Testament, there are many. I think the chief one is the shepherd analogy, and all the other analogies serve to fill up in our thinking what a shepherd is. Well, what is a shepherd's work? Well, shepherds are to be hardworking and patient like farmers, right? So you have the farmer analogy used to speak of the ministry. Well, I think that actually helps us understand what shepherding is. It means you're going to be hardworking working. As you work with God's people, it means you're going to be patient, like a farmer. Shepherds are are disciplined. We stay within the bounds set forth by Scripture. We, We operate according to the Scriptures in a lawful way, just like an athlete must compete according to the rules. Shepherds are loving and sincere guardians and caregivers, like fathers and like mothers, Shepherds dispense, we simply dispense what the chief shepherd has put in the cupboards for his people. We simply dispense what the chief shepherd has designed for his people like a good house manager would. So when you think about these many analogies that are used, farmer, athlete, 
soldier, father, mother, house manager. These analogies serve to give a full picture of what a shepherd is meant to do. The other analogies are informative. They they all, in, in a sense, could stand on their own, but they don't stand alone. Together, they fill up the picture of what we're to be doing in pastoral ministry. And each of those analogies helps us to fill up in our minds these descriptive terms that we find in the New Testament for those who lead the church and teach the church. What are these descriptive terms? Well, there are three that are predominant. Number one, the church's leaders are called elders. Number two, the church's leaders are called overseers. And number three, the church's leaders are called shepherds, pastors. But really, when when it comes to the shepherd terminology, it, it mostly describes the work, not the office. There's one place where it does speak of a gifted man, Ephesians 4, but it usually is used to speak of the work of those who are elders and overseers. Each of these terms emphasizes something slightly different from the other. Each of these terms emphasizes something important about the work that we do. When you think about an elder, you're thinking the Greek word presbyteros. When you think about an elder, what's being emphasized is maturity. In fact, outside of the context of ministry, the, the term elder is used to refer to family heads. The term elder is used to speak of community leaders. The, term, the, the word elder is used to speak of those who are older, older ones in a community. And so even though an elder might be a younger man, the term reminds us that he must not be a new convert. He must not be a novice. Someone who serves as an elder must be spiritually mature. When you think about the term overseer, episkopos, the emphasis there is the responsibility to guide, uh, to oversee, to manage, to care for people, the, the watchfulness that's involved in the care of the church. The, those who serve as elders are, are, are men who are to watch for souls. You care for people's souls. And so the guidance aspect of pastoral ministry, the protective aspect of pastoral ministry, the the soul care nature of the work is emphasized in the term overseer. And then when you think about pastor, poimain, or or shepherd, what's what's emphasized then is is the nature and the manner of the mature oversight. So you have these spiritually mature men who are to be taking oversight with respect to the church, and they are to exercise that mature oversight, functionally speaking, they're to exercise it in the way of a shepherd. How do these spiritually mature men oversee or rule or guide or care for the church? They do it as they do the work of shepherds. And that shepherding responsibility is a steward's responsibility. That's another term that's used to to describe our work. It's a stewardship. In fact, the Apostle Paul said this this is how they wanted to be regarded, as stewards of the mysteries of God. It's a stewardship. Or you could describe it as an accountable servant, or as we said, slave. These shepherds care for the flock of Christ. Christ is the chief shepherd. We are his slaves. And what I want you to know is these terms, elder overseer, shepherd. These terms are interchangeable. They're used in interchangeable ways to speak of the same man, to speak of the same work, to speak of the same office. Let me give you some examples. If you want to turn there, you can, but if not, I'll read it to you. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. In fact, why don't you turn there? I want you to see this with your eyes. Titus 1, look at verse 5. We saw this recently as we worked our way through the book of Titus. Look at the fifth verse, first chapter, Titus 1, verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Okay, what's he going to appoint? Elders. Verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, these are the qualifications, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination for an... Now what term does he use? Overseer. 
And, and, and what is an overseer? As God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So you've got the same man, same office. He's called, these, these men are called elders. They're called overseers. In this context, they're called stewards. All right, look at Acts chapter 20, if you would, real quickly. Acts chapter 20. Paul meeting with the Ephesian elders for the final time. Notice what you see here. Look at verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Skip down to verse 28. What does he say to these elders? He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. There's that shepherding analogy. So they're shepherds, aren't they? This is the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's our term. So there's, they're elders. They are overseers. And what are they to do? To care for the church of God. And the Greek word translated care there, poimino, means to shepherd. They are to shepherd the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So there we see those three terms, elder, overseer, shepherd. And then look back at our, the text we read as we began this morning, 1 Peter chapter 5. And notice again what we see here, verse 1, 1 Peter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. What are these elders to do? Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising, what's the next word? oversight. There it is again. Not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And on he goes to describe our work. So elders have oversight. They're overseers. Their work is the work of shepherding. And as they carry out this work of shepherding, they are stewards. They are stewards. And each of these terms interchangeably being used to refer to the same men, to the same work, to the same office. The term most often used to describe these men in the book of Acts and the New Testament epistles is the term elder, but the Bible makes clear that they have oversight, they rule in the church, Hebrews 13, 17. They, they, they guide the church, they watch for the church, they lead the church, they direct the church, but they do this, you see, they do this as, as shepherds and as stewards. Now, these same terms, not surprisingly, are used of Christ. Well, I'm talking about elder, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about shepherd, I'm talking about overseer. Okay? These terms are used of, of Christ. Look back in 1 Peter for just a moment, chapter 2. Look at verse 25. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ is the shepherd. Christ is the overseer. Well, what does that remind us of? He's not just the savior of the church. He's not just the Lord of the church. He is the goal of the church. He is the model for the church. So that as you think about under shepherds, as you think about those men who serve as elders in the church, who do we have as our model? What kind of shepherding are we to learn and practice? It is the very same mindset, it is the very same character and attitude and love and concern that we learn from Christ. All the under shepherds learn from Christ what it means to be a shepherd. And by the way, all those whom they shepherd are being conformed to that same image too. So the under shepherds are conformed to the image of the chief shepherd and all the people they shepherd are being conformed to the image of the chief shepherd. That's how the church should function. It's in the context of Christ presented as shepherd that he's described as ruling. In the book of Revelation, very interesting, in Revelation chapter Two, verse 25, 
You can look there if you want to. Revelation 2, verse 25. Look at what the Word of God says. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Christ is here exhorting His people to to the fact that if they overcome, they're going to share one day in His future rule over the nations. It's amazing, isn't it? Psalm 2 speaks of this, by the way, verses 7 through 9. He says, Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them. See the word rule there? Poimino means to shepherd. He will shepherd them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Christ says, you as my people will one day share in my rule of the nations. And his rule is what kind of rule? It's a shepherd's rule. Our king is the shepherd king as he rules the nations. Joining together this concept of oversight, ruling, and shepherding. Revelation chapter 7, look there, verse 13 Revelation 7, verse 13, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne, okay, our King, will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Our shepherd sits on the throne. Our shepherd rules And he guides his people to springs of living water and wipes away all their tears. The shepherd, Jesus, guiding, directing, caring for, overseeing the ones who are his. Look at Revelation 19, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule, poimino, same word, he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress wine press of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So the point I'm making is that, is that Christ's example teaches us to think of the shepherding analogy as the primary one. He's a, he is our shepherd, even as he rules as king. He's a shepherd king, and he takes care of his people. You might say, well, what about the term elder? I wonder why that wasn't applied to Christ. Well, listen, he is maturity. <laughs> if the term elder emphasizes the need for maturity and wisdom, he is wisdom. He is maturity. In fact, this is what maturity is. Look at Ephesians 4 real quickly. Again, I want you to see this with your eyes. Look at Ephesians 4. And look at verse 11. You know this passage well, but it's good to be reminded. Ephesians 4, look at verse 11. And He, that is Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, or the pastor teachers. Christ gave gifted men to His church. Christ gives leaders to His church. What's their work? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God 
to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Pastors are given to teach the church that the church might know unity of belief and we might all grow up into mature manhood. And what is mature manhood? It is the fullness of Christ Himself. To grow up into maturity is to grow up into Christ. He is maturity. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, by the way, notice how this happens, speaking the truth in love. See, the shepherding work that leads to the maturity of the saints is a work of preaching and teaching truth that takes place, in fact, as the truth goes forth from from the, the men who teach the church. We instruct each other then with truth. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Dear ones, this is a truth community. Truth doesn't just come from a pulpit. The truth comes from the mouths of the saints of God who covenant to serve Christ together in a community like this one. And as we learn the truth and as we share the truth and as we remind each other of the the truth and hold each other accountable by the truth and exhort each other in the truth, we all grow up together into the same image. And that image is Christ's image. That's what maturity is. So when you see Christ ruling and guiding, it's in the role of shepherd that he does that. And when you apply that to the men who lead the church, then their their maturity is measured by Christ and their leadership, their guiding and watching for souls. It's all in the interest of conformity to Christ. And they carry this work out with the mindset and the manner of shepherds, under shepherds, slaves of the chief shepherd. When you think about this, especially as you bear in mind that Christ is the shepherd and overseer of our souls, when you bear this in mind, you come to see that there's a special emphasis on love. When you think about Jesus as our shepherd, you think about love. And then when you look at the ministry of the apostles, you see that their shepherding ministry was a ministry of love. And what's more, you see that they would only entrust important aspects of ministry, the the most important work of ministry. They would only entrust that ministry responsibility to people who shared their love for the church. Christ teaches us to love his people, even as he loves us. And then we love the people of God, and we should only entrust ministry to people who carry the church in their heart. What I'm saying to you is those who preached to the church, those who taught the church, loved the church. They preached as shepherds, and shepherds love the flock. The shepherd analogy emphasizes strong, genuine, sacrificial love. Faithful shepherds in the Bible are loyal, sacrificial, protective They provide for the flock even at great cost to themselves. That's a shepherd. The chief shepherd teaches us this, John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own. 
and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's a shepherd. He loves the sheep. He cares for the sheep. And so apply that love to the titles, to the terms used for the office. Think in shepherding terms. And my goodness, what a change would be called for in so many churches. So think, for example, about oversight. What what kind of oversight do elders have? It's not the cold, business-like oversight that you would have in some corporation. Right? I even hate the term, and we've talked about this a lot around here, you know, board of elders. It's not a board of elders, there's a body of elders. Board implies that, that corporate m- mentality of let's all sit down now and make decisions. No, this is a loving work. This is a shepherding work. If you want to think about oversight, it's more like the life and death struggle that a father has for children. It's more like that than like some kind of business. Apply it to the need for maturity. Apply it to the term elder. Why do these men need to be mature? Because they're shepherding a blood-bought people. We are a people. We are sheep. The elders and the people are sheep who've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. What value has been set on the church? Christ gave Himself for the church. What love is represented in the people sitting in front of me today. What love of Christ for you. Do you need wisdom to shepherd such a people? Do you need maturity to shepherd a blood-bought people who are precious to Christ? And you see that love exemplified by the apostles. It was so clear, wasn't it, that they had learned their shepherding from the great shepherd of the sheep, and they had learned that their lives were to be wrapped up in the spiritual health and safety and well-being of the people of God. They lived and died with how the church was doing. When you read the New Testament, the Bible just pops with these descriptions of their love for the church. Paul held the Philippians in his heart, Philippians 1.7. He cared for the Thessalonians like a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children, 1 Thessalonians 2.6. When when Judaizers were threatening the gospel in the lives of Galatian believers, Paul expressed his disdain for those false teachers in such explicit terms that, that you might be hesitant to talk about it in polite company. He says, I wish you would emasculate yourselves. You want to talk about circumcision? I wish you would emasculate yourselves. He describes his his burden for those same Galatian believers in Galatians 4.19 by saying that he was like someone in, in the anguish of childbirth until he saw Christ formed in them. He makes clear that his love is not just on personal terms. In Colossians chapter 2, He describes the same kind of love for people he had never met face to face. It's a love that flows out of knowledge, the knowledge of Christ. It's a love that flows out of principle. It's understanding who Jesus is and who the church is and what these precious people mean to him. This is what fuels his love. His love for the Corinthians is especially remarkable because, as you know, he was being accused by false teachers in that region, and and many of the Corinthians had had accepted the lies about Paul. And so when you read First and Second Corinthians, you see a man who's, who's like a father pleading with a wayward child. He is willing to love them even if they don't love him back, Second Corinthians 6 and 7. He makes plain in Second Corinthians 11 that, the, that love for the churches consumed him. He talked about all the things that he had suffered in the way of ministry, but he said the heaviest burden of all was the weight that he carried in his heart day after day after day for the churches, their health, their well-being. What, what, is Paul some kind of super loving person? Is he, is he like unique among the apostles? Is he the only one who carried this kind of weight in his heart? No. Read John, you'll see the same thing. Read Peter, you'll see the same thing. 
And in fact, it was this kind of love that Paul looked for and that he required when he entrusted ministry to somebody. Will you love the church more than you love you? In Philippians 2.20, he sends Timothy to the Philippians because he says that, that Timothy loved them in a unique way. I have no one else like him, he said. Seems like everybody else cares for himself, but Timothy, I'll send to you because he cares for you the way I care for you. Epaphras, Colossians 1 and Colossians 4, Epaphras taught the gospel to the Colossians, and then the Bible says he struggled mightily in prayer for their spiritual well-being and maturity. Romans 16, Paul says that all the churches of the Gentiles were to give thanks for servants like Prisca and Aquila who risked their lives for Paul. Epaphroditus risked his life for Paul, found himself near death, and yet was concerned for the church of Philippi because they were concerned for him. Here's a man near death. He says, you know what really worries me is that you're so worried for me. Philippians 2, verses 25 through 29. We could go on, but the point is clear. Whether you're talking about the Ephesian elders or you're talking about the servants whom Paul mentions in his letters or you talk about Paul himself or John or Peter, those who were entrusted with the care of God's people must share the shepherd's heart of love for those people. And so it's out of a heart of love that the Word of God is to be preached. Preaching is a shepherd's word. How do elders become wise? The Word of God. Are these two things joined together? Pastoral care and the ministry of the Word of God? Well, listen, you can't even be an elder. You can't even be mature in the faith apart from the Word of God. In Acts 20, 32, when Paul's leaving the Ephesian elders for the last time, what does he entrust them to? I now entrust you, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. He leaves them to God and to the Word of God. How is the church to be ruled? You talk about oversight, the elders are to oversee. Well, how is the church to be governed? How is the church to be encouraged, exhorted, disciplined, corrected? What is the instrument by which the church is overseen? The answer is the Word of God. The Word of God rules in this place. The Word of God rules in this community. And the only rule elders have is the the rule of Scripture. You're simply holding the church to the standard of Scripture. 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself, Timothy. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You want to be a good pastor, Timothy? You want to be used as an instrument of God for the salvation of souls, you watch out for yourself and you watch out for your hearers by the standard of the teaching. Watch for your teaching. Keep a close watch on your teaching. And it is that shepherd's love that is wrapped up in all of our proclamation of Scripture. I want you to see this with me. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse 3. Paul writes, As I urged you, Timothy, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Can I just stop and say something? This is... This is such an encouraging passage to struggling pastors. Do you notice what you you just read? What does he tell Timothy to do in verse 3? What's the the, uh, exhortation there in verse 3? Remain at Ephesus. What does remain mean? (laughs) Stay there. Why don't you stay at Ephesus? By the way, is this the first time he's had to urge him to do that? No, look at the first part of verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, I'm, I'm urging you again. Remain at Ephesus. Now, if you're having to tell someone to stay there, what do they want to do? They want to leave. They want to leave. Oh, I'm urging you again. You stay there. Stay there, son. 
Why? You're needed there. Notice. So that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Has to do with the ministry of the Word of God, doesn't it? Verse 4, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship, the stewardship, the stewardship. See, this is a stewardship. God's given something into our care. We're to be faithful with it rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And then notice, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. When we preach the Word of God, the goal, the aim is divine love and a love that is coming out of a pure place, a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. This is how preaching is to be done. It it expresses the love of God, and it's coming from someone who loves God and loves His people. Verse 6 says, certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Here's what I don't want you to miss. Love is not just the goal when it comes to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. It's the guardian. It's when you swerve from the principles of love and a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. When you swerve from that You wander off into the kind of teaching that ruins the souls of people. Someone who doesn't love the church should shut their mouths and sit down. Someone who doesn't love God and doesn't love his church, if if you're not preaching from a shepherd's heart, you should sit down. Because when you stop loving the church, you will eventually mislead the church. You'll wander into Ways that ruin your hearers. If you wonder about the preeminence of the teaching work when it comes to the shepherding work, pastoral care, preaching, wed together, and then if you ask, okay, what, where does the teaching work rank in the shepherding work? I think this is especially instructive in our day when everybody wants to do away with preaching and let's just have small groups. Can we just have one service a week and then we'll just, you know, eat dinner with each other, go to coffee with each other? The, the, the diminishing of the importance of preaching. If you, ask, if you ask, where does preaching rank? Where does teaching rank in the shepherding work? Don't forget 1 Timothy 5.17, which says this, let the elders... Who rule well, I love that sound by the way, you can turn there, First Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. I want you to take note of the men who, who give their lives to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. This is their life. I want you to honor, double honor, all the elders who are faithful in their work, but you especially take care of those who labor in preaching and teaching. Why? Because it's so vital to the life of the church. And so good good shepherding is not just the impartation of God's Word. Listen, it's the impartation of the Word of God as the life is being imparted. Preaching by God's design is meant to be not just the impartation of His Word, but the impartation of your life as you impart His Word. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says this, Paul writes, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Is preaching a shepherd's work? Is what God has designed shepherds 
who preach? Well, I would say pay attention to the New Testament charges. Every one of them that we reference. John 21, Acts 20, 1 Peter 5. Elders are being addressed. What are they exhorted to do? To shepherd. Whose flock is it? Christ's flock. How do you shepherd them? You shepherd them with the Word of God. You feed them. You teach them. How do you guide them with the Word of God? By the standard of Scripture. And then pay attention to these titles. Elders, overseers, who shepherd. Wise in what kind of way? In the image of the chief shepherd. Overseeing in what kind of way? With the heart, the character, the mindset, the love of the chief shepherd. What's the goal of all of our instruction? Love. What's the guardian of all of our instruction? The love of Christ. The love of God. The love of the truth. Preaching is a shepherd's work. Can I ask you? I asked you this last week. I'll ask you again. Do you belong to the shepherd? Who are we shepherding? The world is not our parish. We shepherd the flock of God. We shepherd the sheep. We shepherd people who are born again. We shepherd people who heard the shepherd's voice and followed him. That's who we have the privilege to be an under-shepherd to. You know something? You can't shepherd goats. (laughs) You might hurt them a little bit, but you can't shepherd them. Because the only instrument you have by which to shepherd them, they they can't hear. You can come to them with Scripture and scriptural motivations and scriptural goals and scriptural ambitions and scriptural loves and hatreds, but they can't hear it. You can't shepherd them. Are you shepherdable? (laughs) Can we shepherd you? Are, are you? Are you one who really belongs to our charge? Have you trusted in Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Have you looked to Him for the forgiveness of your sins? The good news, Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Paul was able to say he was the utmost. So if, if Christ, Paul was saying, if Christ can save me, he can save you. Christ came to the world to save sinners. Have you seen yourself as the sinner who needs the Savior? And have you turned from every imagination that somehow you could atone for your own sins and earn God's favor one day? Have you, have you thrown that away for what it is, a worthless imagination? And have you put the full weight of your trust on the one who came into the world from heaven, the eternal Son of God, and lived a sinless life and died as a substitute on a cross to pay for all the sins of all who will trust in Him, who was raised from the dead bodily, who has ascended into heaven and is coming again, alive forevermore, able to save to the uttermost anyone, everyone who will put their faith in Him. Have you turned from your sins and trusted in God's Son? Are you a sheep who can be shepherded with God's words? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our Savior, the chief shepherd of the church, the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. Thank you for your precious word that is to us like a shepherd's crook, that is there for our comfort and our protection and our guidance and our correction. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have together to be conformed to the image of your Son. Teach us his love, teach us his character. Fill us with the shepherd's heart that we might love you and love your church as we should. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.